Chapter Six of the Friendship of Anne, a story by Ellen Douglas Deland. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Anne Talbot had also received several letters that morning, and there was one among them which caused her to feel extremely angry, while at the same time it filled her with curiosity. It was an anonymous letter which perhaps is of all things the most cowardly and unpardonable. If Anne had a little more experience of the world, she would have known that a person who has not the courage to sign his or her name to a letter is a very worthless individual and not of sufficient importance to be listened to. But as she had never in her life before received such a communication, and had never heard the subject discussed, it was not to be expected that she should know that such things should be left unnoticed. It was written in a style that looked something like printing, on a sheet of ruled paper, and its contents were as follows. There is a member of the KQC who ought to be watched carefully. We do not think she is a proper person to belong. Watch. This note had neither the customary beginning nor any signature. Anne examined the postmark and found that it had come from New York. Of course it had to be sent to her because she was the president, and she decided that it was her duty to show it to Ruth Carter, the secretary, and if she thought best, they would give it to the other members of the secret committee to read. No one but the girls who were of this committee knew who belonged to it. The chief object of the KQC appeared to be to make everything as mysterious as possible. Ruth Carter, however, advised that nothing should be said about it at present. Just keep the letter and wait and see what else happens, she said. Anonymous letters are perfectly hateful, and it ought to be burned right up. But perhaps it would be wiser to wait a little while before you do that. The committee might object if we told them afterwards that you had received the letter and hadn't shown it to them. Who can have written it? said Anne reading it for the tenth time, and whom do you suppose they mean? I can't imagine who wrote it, but I shouldn't wonder if they meant Bertha Macy. Somehow I haven't liked the girl from the first. There is something about her I don't trust. Very likely some of the girls have felt the same way and may have really seen something which makes them believe she ought to be dropped. If they had only left it to be done in the proper way, it would have been better. Perhaps a new girl has written it, and she doesn't know what the regular way is. Sometimes I have awful doubts about the club, Ruth, but not often. Most of the time I think it is just too perfect, and I am perfectly thankful the girls who founded it had such a brilliant inspiration. The only new girl who could have written it about Bertha Macy is Sidney Stewart. She doesn't like her very much, but the other new ones are quite intimate with her. But it doesn't seem like Sidney to write this. I shouldn't think so either, but you never can tell. We just have to wait and see what else happens. There will be another before long. You'll see. The afternoon seemed unusually long to Sydney. The time fairly dragged. The weather was beautiful and the girls were out of doors every moment that it was possible. Miss Wickersham had consented to have a tennis court on the level space at the side of the house the side farthest from Braithwaite Hall, but as only four could play, and as Sydney had no racket, she was seldom included in that. There were not as many sports for girls in those days as there are now. Hockey had not been thought of for them, 
and as most of the wickersham girls were from the city they had never attempted basketball or cricket so it was usual to walk about and talk and therefore not have nearly as wholesome or as good a time as girls do nowadays this afternoon sydney's special friends were playing tennis and she was too shy to ask any one else to go with her she went off for a solitary walk this in itself was pleasant enough for she enjoyed merely being out in the soft indian summer air but something occurred as she was returning that disturbed her although she told herself that she was foolish to mind or even notice such a trifle she was coming from the woods which stretched up over the hill behind the schoolhouse the path was quite narrow with a thick growth of trees on one side and the high stone wall which surrounded the braithwaite place on the other just in the narrowest part she met bertha macy and julia clark they were walking arm in arm and were deep in a conversation which appeared to be of a most interesting nature when they saw sydney they stopped talking and drew to one side to let her pass they held their skirts tightly about them precisely as though they did not wish her to touch them sydney made some laughing remark but neither of them took the slightest notice of her except for the fact that they had drawn aside for her to pass it was though they did not see her sydney's face grew scarlet she hurried on without a word she went immediately to her room to lay aside her hat and coat she decided to take a book and read until the study hour but she sat with the book unopened in her hand and before she realized what she was doing she was crying it is perfectly silly of me to mind she said to herself i won't mind but bertha is getting more and more disagreeable i don't know what to do about it it is so hard to room with a girl who dislikes you i know i don't like her either and perhaps that is the reason i suppose margaret would say it to me i suppose margaret would say it was dear old margaret i wish i could see her and talk it over with her and get to thinking right i do hope i can go home for the christmas holidays it would be dreadful to stay here and have everybody go and bertha would look down on me so she looks down on me now that is what it is she thinks i am a nobody well i am poor but that isn't such a dreadful thing as being ill-bred she is that there i am not going to think any more about her i don't care if she is afraid of touching me when we meet she dried her eyes and smoothed her hair looking in the glass with a closer scrutiny than usual in order that all traces of her recent tears might be hidden and when bertha macy came upstairs shortly before the study hour she found her roommate sitting by the window quietly reading bertha bustled about making a great amount of noise but saying nothing she opened and shut all her bureau drawers one after the other she banged her trunk lid upset a chair and finally in her zeal she broke a tumbler at the crash of the glass sydney looked up oh that is too bad she exclaimed and leaving her seat she began to help bertha to gather up the pieces of glass how did you happen to do it she spoke very pleasantly you need not trouble yourself said bertha coldly i can find the glass perfectly well alone oh all right said sydney and presently she left the room in the hall below she met anne talbot anne she said in a rather choked voice i don't know what i am going to do what about do you mean tonight oh it will be easy enough sydney don't 
don't show the white feather if you knew how much depended oh not about tonight i am glad to do that no it is something very different it is about bertha macy anne looked troubled please don't say anything about her now sydney i i would rather you didn't sydney drew back she felt deeply hurt she had counted on anne's friendship and support and evidently anne did not wish to give it to her oh all right she said to her just as she had said it to bertha a few minutes before and then she left her and continued on her way downstairs there i have hurt sydney's feelings awfully exclaimed anne to dolly fearing whom she found in their room she was just going to say something about bertha and i shut her up i couldn't let her especially as i am quite sure she is the one who wrote the anonymous letter she had told dolly about the letter for she always told her everything i don't know why you are so sure sydney wrote that letter said dolly you always feel so certain about things anne but you do sometimes come out wrong well i ought to have answered sydney differently i know that but i was in a tearing hurry and i thought at first that she was going to be a coward about the k q c and then i thought she was going to break another rule and i just had to stop her and of course she doesn't understand i will say something nice to her the first chance i get and so a little later anne smiled and gracious slipped a little package into sydney's hand marshmallows she whispered put them in your pocket and eat them tonight when you go over the wall and you will walk with me a week from friday sid put it down so as not to forget it as if sydney could possibly forget it the very thought of it made her quite happy again it required so little to make her happy or miserable at last the day was over supper had been eaten and the thrilling moment had come for the expedition to braithwaite hall some of the girls were gathered in the library where games were played every evening backgammon chess halma or writing games miss wickersham had retired to her room and miss jeanie was in charge miss abby and one or two of the other teachers had gone to an entertainment that was being given in the town hall and some of the girls were with them it was not strange therefore that sydney's absence from the games was unnoticed as well as that of two other girls anne talbot and marion shaw miss jeanie if she thought of them at all would naturally suppose that they were of the party who had gone into knightsbridge the night had been carefully chosen by the committee for this very reason very quietly a slender figure stole down the stairs and out by the back door it was sydney she wore a gray ulster with a hood which was drawn over her head she closed the door without a sound and found herself alone in the dark garden it was dark now but a little later the moon would be up she crept along the path by the wall down near the corner there was a place where the stones were quite uneven which she had noticed when she passed there in the afternoon it seemed the best place to climb over for they would afford a surer foothold she did not see two figures who followed her down the path drawing more deeply into the shadow when she paused to look about and find the spot which she had selected she clambered up with some difficulty but presently she had gained the top pausing here a moment for breath she found that just at this part of the braywaith garden there was an open space where it would be safe to jump down which she accordingly did the question of getting back did not occur to her 
her one object was to reach her destination as she made her way towards the house the two figures who had followed her appeared upon the top of the wall here they seated themselves and waited braithwaite hall looked dark and forbidding there was one light at the back of the house shining from a room that probably was the kitchen there was another shining through the drawn curtains of some windows on the second story with these exceptions the house had the appearance of being quite deserted but as she drew nearer a sound broke upon the stillness someone was playing on a piano sydney went boldly to the front of the house there was a small porch here its roof supported by tall columns and a short flight of steps led up to the front door she felt for a doorbell but there was none an old knocker hung upon the door but she had not the courage to rap with it instead she turned the knob and found to her surprise that the door was not fastened she opened it and walked in by this time sydney was quite absorbed in the excitement of her adventure her one thought was to carry out the commands of the k q c without regard to any one else she was actually entering some one else's house as slyly as a burglar would have done but it never occurred to her that it was wrong on the contrary she felt a thrill of elation she had been chosen to carry out a most perilous enterprise and she was determined to prove herself worthy so when she found herself in a wide and lofty hall dimly lighted by a small lamp that stood upon a table and heard the wonderful music that came from above her conscience did not trouble her nor her courage waver she walked along the hall and up the broad old-fashioned staircase following the sound until she reached the closed door through which it undoubtedly came again without giving herself time to think that it was wrong she turned the handle of the door and looked in the room was brightly lighted but thick red curtains hung at all the windows and allowed but little of the light to escape into the night without it was a wonderful room and sydney's breath came more quickly as she looked at it pictures hung upon the walls and also great mirrors that extended from the floor to the ceiling the furniture was of old mahogany and there were cabinets and shelves filled with beautiful china there was not a book to be seen at one end of the long room with her back to the door at which sydney stood sat a lady at the piano she was playing with such marvelous skill that sydney who loved music listened in wonder and delight suddenly in the midst of the crashing of the chords the player paused the sudden silence was intense she did not turn around but she bent her head slightly to one side that is not eliza she said who is it who is there without a word sydney closed the door and ran down the stairs at the bottom she paused and listened was the lady following her no it was quiet but just then a bell sounded at the back of the house and she heard a step approaching from the kitchen she ran to the front door and in another moment was out once more in the night she hurried round the corner of the house and tried to find her way to that part of the garden by which she had entered it was very dark and she was so agitated by her anxiety to escape that she lost her bearings and wandered about the overgrown garden paths not knowing which way to turn but finally she reached the wall and made her way as best as she could through the bushes to the place where she had climbed over but climbing back was another matter there was no convenient stepping stones on the braithwaite side 
and after many unsuccessful efforts to get up she decided that unless she could discover a possible crossing between there and the road it would be necessary for her to go out of the front gate and walk boldly along the road and in front of the wickersham place she hesitated to do this for she had been explicitly commanded to scale the wall but as that was clearly out of the question and as time was going fast she must return as best as she could or run the chance of being locked out for that night her absence would be discovered and what would happen then she dared not think clearly she must get back and as soon as possible it was growing lighter now above the tree tops a silvery glow lighted upon the east the moon was rising she paused a moment to watch it the glow deepened and now a bright spot showed clearly growing larger and larger until the great round moon was up and looking at her as she stood there watching then she bethought herself once more of the need for haste it was easy now to find her way but even by the moonlight she could discover no available means of climbing over the wall she walked quickly to the road and very soon she turned in at the school gate she had not seen a group of people who were walking from the direction of the town and could see her very distinctly they reached wickersham gate and entered it just as sydney passed round the back of the house she went in by the same door by which she had gone out the two figures who followed her to the wall when she went were waiting for her here she saw them now for the first time is that you anne she exclaimed with a whisper yes and marion shaw we were chosen to watch you you did splendidly sid except not coming back the way you went i couldn't but i have had such an exciting time don't stop to tell us now said marion shaw though we are simply wild to hear about it get up to your room as quickly as possible be very careful they crept into the house and closed softly closed the door as they walked through the corridor the front door at the other end opened and the party of teachers and pupils who had been to the entertainment at the town hall came in and talbot hastily opened the door of a convenient cloak closet under the stairs which had sheltered girls before this and drawing sydney by the hand and followed by marion she pulled the door to until merely a crack remained it was impossible to close it entirely here they waited scarcely daring to breathe if miss abby should chance to come to the closet but she did not instead she and her companions passed directly into the library and peering through the crack watched them and then when the coast was clear she and marion and sydney hurried up the stairs and gained their rooms in safety it had been a narrow escape and although miss abby had distinctly seen a figure enter the place which looked suspiciously like one of the pupils she was unable to discover who had been walking alone at that unseemly hour End of chapter six recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c chapter seven of the friendship of anne a story by ellen douglas deland this librivox recording is in the public domain the following day anne talbot received a second anonymous letter it was written in the same print-like hand as the first which was evidently a disguised hand the paper and envelope were the same but the postmark this time was kingsbridge and its contents were a little longer this is what it said there is a member of the k q c 
who ought not to belong i have told you this before but i did not tell you then that there is a mystery about her and a disgrace i will not tell you now what that disgrace is but i warn you that she must be put out or i will resign and tell the reason she is not a person to have in a ladies club this was certainly a very startling communication for the president of a club to receive anne's feelings were a mixture of indignation contempt and curiosity she was an impulsive girl loving and loyal to a degree but like every one else in this world she occasionally made a mistake her judgment was not always to be depended upon in this case she already decided that sydney was the author of the first anonymous note and having allowed that decision to establish itself very firmly in her mind it was easy enough when the second letter came to believe that sydney had written this one also she was so sure of this that she almost succeeded in convincing ruth and dolly also i know she wrote them she said when the three were walking arm in arm about the grounds at recess discussing the matter so intently that they were noticed by more than one of the girls sydney has something on her mind for some time she has tried to tell me several times and i have shut her right up there was nothing for her to do but write these letters she means bertha macy of course well i am just going to speak my mind out plainly this afternoon at the meeting she ought not to write such things but anne i think you are a little hard on sydney said dolly fearing you see yourself that she has wanted to speak to you about it and you wouldn't let her what else could she do dolly the idea of your standing up for her she oughtn't to do anything there is no need for her to tell us about any disgrace i suppose she means disgrace in bertha's family for of course there is nothing a girl could have done herself and what difference does it make whether there is disgrace in a person's family if the girl herself behaves all right in school and in connection with the club i am sure i don't care anything about her family or what they may have done and i know you don't either i am disappointed in sydney i really am but anne we don't know for certain that it is sydney of course it is who else could have written about bertha but we don't know that the person means bertha why of course it is bertha who else could it be this seemed unanswerable and as anne was a girl who spoke with much vehemence and decision her remarks were apt to be convincing in spite of their calmer natures and less hasty utterances ruth and dolly felt less sure than at first that anne might be mistaken it really seemed very possible not to say probable that sydney had written the two notes there was to be a meeting of the k q c that very afternoon as the warm weather still continued it was to be held in the arbor the arbor was a rustic summer house at the entrance to the woods behind the schoolhouse it was quite large and of a circular shape a seat extended around its entire circumference on this the members took their places and at the appointed hour there was a rough board table in the center and a chair had been placed upon it for the president it always seemed to add to the dignity of the office for the chair to be elevated as much as possible 
Ruth Carter, with her roll book and papers, sat in another chair beside the table. The president's chair was placed with its back to the entrance of the arbor, but as the seat occupied by the members extended from one side of this entrance around the arbor to the other side, it was impossible for the president to face all the girls. She could not see those behind her except by turning. As it happened, Bertha Macy sat by the doorway and, there, and was therefore completely out of Anne's range of vision. Ruth could not see her face either, for the president's chair obstructed her view. Sydney, on the contrary, sat right in the middle of the row and directly in front of Anne. The roll was called and the preliminary business transacted, and then the president, rapping for order with a piece of wood instead of the back of a brush, in deference to the out-of-door meeting, began her customary speak. Friends and members of the KQC, she said, I have to report the successful undertaking of a very perilous adventure last night. One of our new members proved to be equal to the occasion. She was watched and not found wanting. Neither was she found out. On the contrary, she was found in. When our dear friend and instructress, Miss A., who would always be glad to find us out, if she could, poked her dear elongated nose into one room after the other last night to see that all was as it should be, she found our respected new member in her bed. Will the member who performed the adventure kindly rise and tell us all about it? This to Sydney was quite unexpected. She had not supposed that she would be called upon to speak in public. She looked at Anne imploringly, but the president was inexorable. Rise, Miss Stewart, if you please, and give us an account of scaling the wall. Sydney, her color coming and going with painful intensity, stood up. She spoke very fast, the words tumbling over one another in her agitation. Oh, I climbed the wall down there by the corner and went in the front door. I heard music and went upstairs and looked in. The lady was playing, and then I ran out again and came home. I couldn't climb the wall on that side, so I came back by the road. Did you discover anything about the lady? No, except that she plays beautifully. There was something else to be discovered said the president in her most oracular manner can any one here present tell me what it was no one appeared to know for no one spoke evidently you don't know well i am not going to tell you but i will tell you this whoever is chosen to go in there again is expected to find out what i mean there is a reason why it is very proper that the KQC should get to know that lady and be of use to her. One great object of the KQC is to be useful. I think after all I will tell you. That little lady is blind. She can't see a thing. Miss Stewart, we are very much pleased at the way you accomplish such a difficult task, and the club congratulates you. Sit down now, Sydney, and don't blush your head off. This unexpected ending to the president's very formal and impressive speech made everyone laugh, and poor Sydney, her face of the deepest scarlet, was glad to take her seat. There was no way of hiding her face, however, and her blushes had already made her the butt of the school. Some mischievous girl had discovered that by speaking suddenly to Sidney Stewart, you could turn her cheeks from palest pink to a fine Harvard crimson in an instant. 
she had imparted this interesting fact to the others and it was a favorite pastime with them all to address her unexpectedly or even to say are you for yale or harvard sydney and then scream with laughter at the looked-for result everyone knows that schoolgirls are capable of many forms of persecution and sydney's extreme shyness made it impossible for her to defend herself anne had frequently come to her rescue but anne had been peculiar the last day or two this shot of hers at the close of her speech reduced sydney almost to tears but she managed to keep them back as a consequence however she was in a somewhat agitated condition of mind which soon became intensified by what followed i have got something to say which i don't like to say at all said anne it makes me very uncomfortable but it has got to be done so here it goes there is some one in this club who is doing very queer things and she might just as well stop doing them right off i shan't say exactly what they are the guilty person knows what she has done and it isn't necessary for any one else to know i don't know for certain myself who it is but i have consulted with others and we decided that the best plan was for me to speak to you all this afternoon and then whoever had a guilty conscience could take it to herself and understand that that sort of thing won't do in this club anne involuntarily let her eyes rest for a moment on sydney's face as she spoke and having looked once she looked again there is no use in hinting at disgrace or any such stuff as that she said with a vehemence staring at sydney the girl looked at her sydney was very pale now and there was a strange expression in her eyes that would have attracted the attention even of one who had until now suspected nothing anne looking for something wrong found even more than she had anticipated ruth and dolly also glanced at sydney and were impressed by her appearance bertha macy and julia clark with another object in their minds stared at her without any attempt to disguise their interest a common impulse soon spreads among a group of persons it was not long before it was almost unanimously decided that whatever it was that had been done sydney stuart was the girl who did it and what was sydney thinking she was conscious that anne was accusing her of something anne whom until now she had regarded as her best friend in the school anne had used the words guilty and disgrace it meant of course that anne had heard that was it she knew and she no longer wished to have sydney for a friend sydney could not think clearly at this moment she had already been greatly embarrassed by being called upon to rise and speak in public she had not a moment in which to recover herself before this strange and startling accusation had been made and it was clearly directed against herself there was a singing in her ears and anne's voice seemed to come from very far away there must be no underhand ways in this club she was saying i am just as mad as a hornet about this business if you have got anything to say about anybody be mighty careful it is true before you begin to talk about it and then the only thing to do is to come boldly to ruth or dolly or grace king or me and say what you mean and be willing to stand by it you will find out in time the meaning of k q 
we had the club all last year and didn't have one particle of trouble we have all thought it a splendid club and i think it will be too bad if any one goes to work and spoils it anne had a temper and she was letting it go sydney did not understand a word that she had said she only knew that anne was angry with her and it must be because she had heard ruth carter saw her anguish of mind and was sorry for her although she was now convinced that anne had been right from the beginning and that sydney was really the author of the letters she felt that it was time to interpose and stop the president's tirade she stood up please mr president may i speak she said yes you may said anne shortly though i hadn't half finished what do you want to say only that there is a lot of business to be transacted and time is going it is quarter of four and we haven't heard about the family by the duck pond they were to be visited again you know oh of course said anne i forgot all about that emma fisher you went to see them didn't you you and amy wright will miss fisher please tell us what they did so emma fisher described their visit to the poor family to whom they had taken some old clothing and some food purchased with contributions of money from two or three of the girls the k q c really accomplished some good work as well as some harm after this the meeting was brought to a close there was only time for the usual singing of the rhyme of membership the undercurrent of suspicion and bad feeling made everyone uncomfortable and the girls were glad when it was time to disperse they broke up into groups of two or three and in this way walked back to the house what was the trouble something awful for anne was so mad and she was evidently mad with sydney stuart it must be something very serious for anne had always seemed to like sydney until now what could it be well they would all stand by anne for there never was such a nice girl certainly the most popular girl in school though she had a terrible temper as for sydney well no one knew anything about sydney stuart she had always seemed a very nice kind of a girl really very sweet but there was no doubt that she had done something horrid if anne who had always liked her thought so why of course it must be simply dreadful this was the way they all talked all that is with the exception of ruth carter and dolly fearing and the result may be imagined by bedtime sydney believed that she had not a friend in the world the whole trouble came from exaggerated thinking and too hasty decision anne decided that sydney had written the letters and in writing them had been guilty of almost a crime sydney decided that her family troubles had been discovered and that she was being condemned accordingly and worst of all for they really were the authors of all this mischief bertha macy and julia clark in their thoughtlessness desire to pay back a girl whom they did not like and whose dislike of themselves they resented had made use of dishonorable ways to do her harm and were directly responsible for all the trouble for of course we know that they had composed the anonymous letters julia thought of the scheme and bertha who could disguise her handwriting very cleverly had carried it out it all came from one wrong action on the part of these two girls the day sydney received her two letters 
it will be remembered that she met bertha and julia on the stairs they saw the communication from the k q c in her hand and were at once fired with curiosity to know what she had been called upon to do later when bertha discovered the envelope on sydney's table the temptation to read it became too strong for her to resist julia coming to her room at just this moment was likewise tempted they were sure this letter was from the k q c for the writing on the envelope was precisely the same as that on which julia had received the day before what harm could be there in glancing at the contents after all they said to each other they were members of the same club and they knew this note was from the club so they argued and easily succeeded in convincing themselves that it was not such a very wrong thing to do they would never tell anyone of course that they had done it they promised each other eternal secrecy and julia drew out the letter and opened the closely written sheet which bertha looked over her shoulder each gave an exclamation of surprise but continued to read for it was the letter from margaret stuart to her sister sydney had carelessly placed her letters in the wrong envelopes and the one she had burned in the stove downstairs had not been her sister's letter containing several references to her family affairs to sydney's life at school and her difficulties with her roommate and the advice to destroy the letter at once the girls read every word of it bertha understood at once that she was the person referred to as miss m and her wrath was very great all thought of the dishonor of their actions was forgotten by these two girls engaged in reading someone else's letter they both knew that they were doing wrong but they were completely carried away by anger and curiosity as to the affairs of the stuarts what can it be said julia evidently they are very queer people they used to live in baltimore i know for sydney said so once when someone asked her if they had always lived in new york she said no and didn't seem to want to talk about it and then i asked where they lived before that and she said baltimore and when i said why that is very near wilmington delaware where i live she got scarlet the way she does and wouldn't say another word about it do you know any one in baltimore asked bertha why yes i have an aunt who lives there we always spend christmas there then couldn't you find out about them i shouldn't wonder if i could i'll do my best and in the meantime i don't think she ought to be allowed in the same club with nice people said bertha the idea of the sister writing about me and saying i am curious sydney must have made up a lot of things about me i never could bear her and then julia suggested the writing of the anonymous letters after which they returned margaret stuart's letter to the table where they had found it and left the room rather elated than otherwise by their day's work End of chapter 7 Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Chapter 8 of The Friendship of Anne A Story by Ellen Douglas Deland This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Naturally enough, after this, the social relations of most of the girls at the wickersham school became very much strained there were few who did not turn away altogether from sydney 
although the trouble was not immediately understood something was wrong and it is so easy to take the worst view of a situation rather than the better the few who remained friendly towards her were ruth carter dolly fearing and a girl named elsie brent ruth was one who required absolute proof of whatever she was to believe until she knew it to be a fact that sydney had written the letters she could not treat her as though she had done so dolly loved peace to be in a state of hostility with another was to her positive torture you could see this in her face and in her eyes even if sydney had done greater wrong than writing two anonymous letters about a schoolmate it is doubtful if she would have turned against her entirely elsie brent remained faithful because she loved sydney she was of the same age but was in the class below anne and dolly and sydney but sydney being backward in mathematics was with her in arithmetic elsie was not clever at her lessons and they had become very friendly over the miseries of a study which both disliked and sydney had done one or two little kindnesses for elsie which won her heart elsie was an unusual girl she was fifteen and was very tall for her age with heavy dark hair and a face that would have been plain had it not been for her wonderful eyes they were large and dark and honest she was not shy but she was of a reticent nature that made her slow in gaining friends she did not mind this she preferred to read very often rather than join in the games or the conversation it was no hardship for her to walk alone she was perfectly indifferent to the fascination of anne talbot or any one else whom the other girls raved about but she had given her allegiance to sydney stuart and with the strength of her nature she remained faithful sydney was quite unconscious of the depth and quality of her affection and it is doubtful if she ever would have known it if vents had not taken place to call it forth sydney felt very much alone during the first few days after the meeting of the k q c described in the last chapter she was so sure that anne was alienated because of the trouble in her own family that she made no effort at reconciliation she could not explain this trouble and she was too proud to beg anne to overlook it without explanation anne on the contrary really liked sydney but believing that she had written the letters became more and more indignant with her because she did not come forward and apologize for having done so and try to straighten the matter out ruth and dolly could not succeed in modifying her views anne was a very determined young person and it was difficult to convince her that she was ever in the wrong and matters were in this state when something else happened and as is very often the case the weather played an important part in bringing it about indian summer was quickly over and immediately afterwards winter set in the days were short now and dreary clouds gathered or rain fell nearly every day and at last one morning it was the day before thanksgiving the inhabitants of kingsbridge awoke to find it snowing this first flurry did not last long however and by noon the sun was shining fitfully although a bank of clouds in the west suggested that more snow might be coming soon the pupils did not go home to pass thanksgiving 
the holidays at that time were not long enough to make it worth while there was no school that day or friday however and it was a season of leisure and fun those of the girls who were so fortunate as to know some of the residents of knightsbridge were invited to their homes and some had been asked to bring friends with them Aunt talbot had been long engaged to go to a supper party on thanksgiving night to be given by a mrs tracy who was her mother's cousin and who lived in a large house at some distance from the wickersham school mrs tracy had also invited three of anne's friends and anne had selected dolly fearing ruth carter and sydney stuart it was considered the proper thing to do to ask one of the new girls of the year and anne had chosen sydney this of course was before the trouble sydney now felt very uncomfortable about it but hesitated to give it up she did not know what she ought to do of course anne said nothing she could not request sydney to stay at home though there was no doubt that she would be relieved if sydney would herself suggest it the afternoon before thanksgiving day sydney having gained permission to take a walk started out alone from the gates of the wickersham school and turning away from the town and towards the open country she walked rapidly along the road she had not gone far when she heard quick footsteps behind her while her name was called in a rather breathless voice she looked back and saw elsie brent running fast in her efforts to overtake her sydney felt a moment's regret she would much rather walk alone this afternoon she told herself she wanted to be alone and think things over of course it would have been the very worst occupation possible but she did not realize this thinking things over in solitude very often makes one take an unfortunate view of them there was nothing to do but to wait for elsie who soon caught up to her i saw you going off and i thought i would come with you said elsie i had asked miss wickersham if i could go to walk and i was going alone but i would a great deal rather come with you if you don't mind this was a great compliment on elsie's part had sydney but known it it was not often that she ran after another girl in order to walk with her oh all right said sydney not very cordially you don't want me do you said elsie in her blunt fashion she was a girl of a few words but they were usually very much to the point but i am coming all the same i want to tell you something and this seems a good chance to do it which way are you going i was going up the lane that leads off from this road and over the hill into those woods that are beyond i love woods in winter but i would just as leave go any other way if you would rather no i like that and it will give us a good chance to talk for you don't meet the other girls up there much they all love going to town and buying candy i don't mind the candy but i hate the shops have some she had thrust her hand into her ulster pocket and brought out a paper bag containing some of the famous tinkerham caramels that were so deservedly popular year after year with the girls at the wickersham school sydney accepted the proffered dainties and being a perfectly normal girl was rather glad after all that elsie had joined her one must be very eccentric and morbid not to be mollified by a gift of caramels when one is a schoolgirl and apparently deserted by one's other friends 
I saw you sneaking off, continued Elsie, and I knew you'd end by crying if you were off by yourself. You're having a horrid time, and I just wanted to tell you. Here utterance was stopped for a moment by her inability to manage the caramel. You needn't tell me anything, interposed Sydney hastily. If people want to drop me, they can. I don't care. Oh, yes, you do, cried Elsie, now able to speak fluently once more. You care very much. Anyone would care. I don't know what all the trouble is about, but I do know that I don't give up my friends for any trifle. You were good to me that day I got stuck in my arithmetic and explained things better than any teacher. I've never forgotten it, and I like you. You say you don't know what the trouble is. No, and what is more, I don't care. If a person is once my friend, they're always my friend. It is very nice of you to say that, Elsie, but perhaps if you knew what the trouble really was, you would feel different. Perhaps even you wouldn't overlook what it is. Oh, pshaw, exclaimed Elsie. I have an idea about it, and I don't mind in the least. There's a lot of talk, and I don't know how much is true and how much isn't. After all, what does it matter if you did write the letters? It wasn't such a crime. Letters? repeated Sydney, somewhat mystified. I don't know what you mean. Well, I'm sure I don't either. Don't let's talk about it. I only want you to understand that I am your friend whatever happens. You can just depend upon that. To Elsie's great surprise, and possibly a little to her dismay, for she was very undemonstrative, Sydney stopped in the lane and, putting her arms around her friend's neck, began to cry. There, I knew you were intending to cry, but I thought I could head it off, said Elsie. Instead of that, I seem to have brought it on. I can't help it, murmured Sydney. I just, just can't help it. I've been feeling so badly, and now uh, to find that you, you... Oh, come now, exclaimed Elsie, but very kindly. Just hush up, Sid. What did you take me for anyway? You must have thought I was a pretty sort of girl to turn against a friend the minute she got into any scrape. Why, that's the time to stand by them. I don't know what Aunt Talbot is thinking of. I didn't suppose she was any kind of girl to give you up as soon as trouble comes. She has good reason for it said sydney hastily very likely i should feel the same way if i were in her place it isn't that i have done anything myself but some people mind things that that have happened in other people's families i don't know what under the sun you are talking about said elsie her honest face looking very much puzzled. But as I said, you needn't try to explain to me if you don't want to. Of course, if it is going to relieve your mind to talk things over, you can do it. But as far as I am concerned, it doesn't make a bit of difference. I haven't heard what anyone supposes it to be except some stuff about letters, and I'm sure I don't care whether you wrote them or not, as far as my feelings for you go, though I would rather my friends didn't do anything underhand. That is the second time you have said something about letters, said Sydney. I wish you would tell me what letters you mean. Well, I won't. I don't really know. 
you know the girls don't care for me very much i don't care for many of them and i have only heard a lot of buzzing and haven't asked a question i may have gotten it all wrong don't let's talk about it sid well we won't but there is something i should l like to ask your advice about ever so long ago anne asked me to go with her to mrs tracy's she is some relation of hers you know and anne is going there to a thanksgiving party and was told she could bring some friends and she asked me mrs tracy wrote me a very nice note inviting me and i accepted now i don't know what to do about it of course i know anne doesn't want me to go it makes me feel dreadfully to go where i know i am not wanted but i don't know how to explain to mrs tracy that i can't come what shall i do it did indeed seem a very difficult proposition and elsie having had very little experience of the world was uncertain as to the proper course to be pursued but though she had no experience she did possess a fair amount of common sense she thought the matter over a few minutes do the miss wickershams know anything about all this she asked presently they know they know about our troubles said sydney hesitantly i don't know whether they know about all this fuss i shouldn't wonder if they did they usually know everything why don't you talk it over with miss jeanie she could advise you oh i couldn't exclaimed sydney i just couldn't and besides margaret advised me not to talk about it with anyone margaret your sister you mean yes well i suppose she knows best but wasn't that before any of this fuss yes before i left home perhaps she wouldn't say the same thing now if she knew all about everything now perhaps she would advise you to talk to miss jeanie no i don't think she would well of course you know what she would say better than i do but i don't see how i can go to that party with anne continued sydney ruth and dolly are the others who are going and they haven't been disagreeable to me but they have been a little cool and anne oh anne has been like an icicle and oh elsie i do care for her so much that is the worst of it i am so fond of her still even though that is the worst of it i am so fond of her still even though she is so queer and has turned against me so elsie was silent her loyal heart suffered she could not help feeling a pang of jealousy she knew sid carried a great deal more for anne than she did for her even now and she did so long to be first with her but she struggled against the feeling which she knew to be an unworthy one and presently she was able to speak in her usual voice i suppose it is hard for you she said yes it is very hard when you care so much for a person not to have them believe in you and stick to you can nothing be done to bring back her to liking me asked sydney what would you do again elsie was silent then she said i think i should keep right on caring for her and trust to its getting straight again some day if i could i would go to her and say see here something's wrong and i want to explain it if i can i can't do that interposed sydney i simply can't tell her the family trouble very well then 
the only thing you can do is to wait but about going tomorrow night i am sure i don't know how to advise you but the matter was destined to be settled for sydney without the advice of any one all the time they had been talking the girls had pursued their way steadily up the lane and through the woods they had paid no heed to time or weather and had not noticed that the bank of clouds which had darkened the western horizon had been moving steadily forward until now the sky was completely overcast in the woods they did not think about the sky nor feel the wind and therefore when they came out into the open they were surprised to find that it was snowing and that it was rapidly growing colder they were rather glad than otherwise to see the snow for its gave promise of coasting and the hills about knightbridge were fine for that sport they continued on their way and soon were talking about other matters than the one which had so absorbed them i think there is a short cut across the field that leads to a road said De Sydney, a sort of a back road that takes you over the woods back of the school we might go home that way all right assented elsie if you are sure it does it looks as if we are going to have a regular storm and we better get back by the shortest way this is ever so much shorter i am quite sure it is and i know just how to get there i came up here one day a few weeks ago just after school began ruth carter was with me and she showed it to me we climb the wall here and go right across to that opposite corner they climbed the low stone wall and set out across the field but it is one thing to find one's way on a clear bright day when one can see a long distance and and note familiar landmarks such as the position of certain hills or the spires of the town or the course of the river which could be seen from here and quite another matter to lay one's course as they say at sea when a blinding snow squall is raging and all those landmarks are blotted out of sight for the snow was falling now with all the vigor of a winter storm the wind had risen and was blowing it into swirling eddies sending it against their faces and into their eyes it was a great fun at first and the girls laughed and bent their heads to meet its fury hurrying across the field stumbling into holes and over stones for it was a new england pasture and therefore rough and rocky on they went for what seemed a very long time this must be a very big pasture said elsie at last shouldn't you think we would soon get across it it seems to take ever so much longer than it did the other time replied sydney but i suppose this cold wind makes it seem so we'll get to the other side soon i am sure but it was half an hour before they reached the stone wall which surrounded the pasture unable to see where they were going they had been walking round and round almost in a circle at last they came to a wall here we are cried sydney joyfully and here is the road i knew we should find it if we only kept straight on now we turn to the right and very soon we get to those other woods and then it is all as easy as possible but they had reached a wall which was on quite an opposite side of the pasture to what she imagined there was a road there which had the appearance of the one she was looking for and without a moment's doubt she turned to the right and struck out as she supposed for wickersham school but instead of this 
they were every moment leaving it behind them and going farther and farther away the storm showed no sign of abating and in fact was getting worse the snow already lay thick on the ground and the wind grew stronger and colder it was the beginning of a snowstorm that proved to be a memorable one which although it came in november caused great damage and loss of life all over the country and these two girls were quite lost hurrying as best as they could into the open country and the heart of the storm end of chapter eight recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c chapter nine of the friendship of anne a story by ellen douglas delan this librivox recording is in the public domain sydney i believe we are going wrong said elsie fifteen or twenty minutes later we ought surely to have reached those woods back of the school by this time the same thought had been in sydney's mind but she would not yet acknowledge it oh we can't be she said of course it seems very long in this awful storm i never felt such a cold wind and it is so dreadful not to see more than a yard in front of us that is the reason it doesn't look natural but the woods persisted elsie i don't see why we don't get to those woods i'm afraid we have lost our way i don't see myself why we don't get to them but we can't be lost elsie we couldn't possibly be lost a little later she was forced to agree that they were i am sure we should have come to some houses before this she said there are certainly houses on that road i remember especially a farmhouse for there was a big black dog that came out and barked at us if we could only come to a house we might go in and ask our way or stay there until it stops snowing remarked elsie oh how my fingers ache aren't yours nearly frozen yes i am what are we to do shall we turn and go back along this road do you suppose we could find that pasture again and cross it and go back by the road we came i'm sure we could never find it we must have gone wrong while we were crossing the field and i should be afraid to try it again even if we found the pasture if only some wood would come along the road no one will do that it looks as if no one ever went over it if we only could come to a signboard or something and it must be getting very late elsie what will they think at the school that we are lost in the snowstorm perhaps they will send out to look for us i am afraid they will never find us even in the midst of their anxiety as to their whereabouts it occurred to sydney to wonder if anne would care would she be worried at her disappearance oh if anne would care a little sydney felt that she would be repaid for any amount of physical suffering and they were both suffering and without speaking of it to the other each was thinking that it would be impossible to hold out much longer i think it would be better to turn said elsie evidently we are going into the depths of the country and if we go the other way we shall surely get back to kingsbridge somehow we won't leave the road for any field but just follow it until we get somewhere don't you think so yes i do come on they turned and began to retrace their steps already their former footprints had been obliterated by the following snow or the wind which was blowing it about and causing it to drift badly hark said sydney presently 
I am sure I hear a horse coming. Oh, Elsie, there is something coming. It certainly sounded like a swiftly trotting horse, and almost immediately its shape loomed through the storm, coming from the direction in which they had been walking before they turned. Stop him, stop him, cried Elsie. Don't let him get by. They waved their arms and called. The horse shied badly at this unexpected sight, but the driver pulled him up and held him in. Can you tell us the way to Kingsbridge? asked Sydney. We are lost and nearly frozen. Is it this way or that? You were going in the right direction, replied the young man, but you are miles away from the town. I am going there myself. Won't you let me take you? I should be very glad to. His voice was pleasant and was that of a gentleman. He was muffled in a fur coat with its collar turned up, and a sealskin cap was drawn down over his ears. The part of his face that could be seen showed it to be that of a young man. Oh, thank you, cried both girls together. Can you really take us? Of course I can. If you don't mind being a bit crowded, I would give you my seat and sit on the floor behind, but I am afraid you couldn't manage this horse. He is something of a high flyer anyway, and he doesn't like the storm. If one of you will sit beside me and the other climb in at the back, I am awfully sorry. I can't get out and help you, but I don't dare. Oh, we can get in all right, said the girls. I was never so thankful in my life, added Sydney. I think we should have perished with cold if we had had to be out much longer and never have found our way either. By this time they had both climbed in, Sydney beside their rescuer and Elsie in the open space behind on the floor. It was a light road wagon with no top. You will be colder still driving, said the young man. Here, one of you take this robe and wrap it round you, and there is a horse blanket under the seat for the other. If you don't mind using it, if I had known I was to have the pleasure of two lady passengers, I should have provided wraps. They all laughed. If we had known we were going to take a drive, we should have worn extra ones ourselves, said Sydney. We don't usually expect people to provide coats as well as carriages when they take us to drive. She had quite forgotten to be shy. Indeed, it would be out of the question to be shy when rescued in a snowstorm, especially by such a very friendly and nice young man as this appeared to be. I suppose you are at the Wickersham School, he said presently. Yes, and what Miss Wickersham is thinking of us now, I don't know. What will she say? I don't see how she can blame you. No one ever supposed a storm as this was coming up. Anyhow, just refer her to me. I will sign a certificate before the notary public, testifying that I came across you in a half-frozen condition, a good five miles away from Knightsbridge. By the way, I must tell you my name, or you won't know whom to refer to. Alexander Tracy, at your service. Residence, High Street, Kingsbridge, Harvard Class of 82. Now, without seeming too forward, may I ask your names? Elsie Brent, behind you, and Sidney Stewart, beside you. And, oh, you must be Mrs. Tracy's son. I have heard of you. I certainly claim that honor, and I am so glad my fame has spread so far. Do you know my mother? She asked me to come to her party tomorrow night with Anne Talbot. Good. I knew you must be a friend of ours. I've been home only since this morning, so I hadn't heard the particulars about tomorrow night. Anne is my cousin, you know. 
I'm glad she is a friend of yours. Isn't she jolly? Yes, said Sydney, and then was silent. She had forgotten her troubles for a time. Now they descended upon her again. After all, Anne was not her friend. But I am not sure I can come, she added. Why not? Oh, I hope you will. Oh, do please say you will. Why on earth shouldn't you? It was, of course, impossible to explain, and with this very cordial young man beside her, urging her to be there and demanding her reasons for not being there and he certainly was very nice it would be such fun to go even if anne did not want her even with that black cloud upon the horizon it might be fun but still she hesitated i don't know she said at last i accepted mrs tracy's invitation and have been hoping to go but lately something has turned up and i thought i might have to write her i couldn't be there but perhaps i can come good now you've promised and you've got to keep it we'll give you a jolly good time i've got a chum there he's my roommate at cambridge fred merriam he was coming with me this afternoon but my mother got him to go with her over to Brookville to buy fixings for the party. I had to go to a farm way back in the country to get the turkey for tomorrow's dinner. It's under the seat. By the way, Miss Brent, he said, turning to speak to Elsie, I hope that gobbler isn't in your way. There was no answer. Sydney looked over her shoulder. Elsie was crouching in the bottom of the wagon. Her face could not be seen. Elsie, why don't you answer? What is the matter? exclaimed Sydney. She must be ill. Elsie, she is ill. Do stop and let me get out. Better keep right on, said Alec Tracy, touching his horse with the whip. There is no danger of her falling out in that position and the sooner we get her into a warm house the better she must have fainted she said her hands were fearfully cold she was in perfect agony that's it then it's horrible pain i knew a fellow who fainted once from that very cause sydney was leaning over the back of the seat and had her arm around her friend they were going along at a great speed and she did not notice this, nor the fact that they were entering the town. Presently they turned in at a wide gate, and stopped in front of a large yellow house with white fluted columns. Then she looked up. Why, where are we? she asked. Haven't you brought us to the school? No, our house is ever so much nearer, for I took a short cut to get here. I thought your friend ought to get indoors as quickly as we could manage it, and my mother will look after her. She loves to look after people. A man who evidently been watching for him came round the side of the house and held the horse while he got out and helped Sydney to alight. Pretty bad storm, Thomas, he said pleasantly. These two young ladies were caught in it, and one of them is ill. Then he turned to Elsie. She was very tall and broad, and he lifted her from the carriage and walked up the steps of the piazza with her in his arms, as easily as though she had been a baby. Just open the front door, he said to Sydney. We can go right in. I hope mother has got home. She did as he bade her, and they entered the house. They were all three covered with snow. He placed Elsie on the sofa in the broad hall, which extended from the front to the back of the house. You look after her. Take off her things and rub her hands. We mustn't take her too near the fire at first. I will get mother or somebody. In a moment, Mrs. Tracy was with them. She came quickly downstairs, her face full of concern. 
you poor children she exclaimed here take away those cushions she must lie very flat ah she is opening her eyes slowly elsie came back to the present out of a blackness and distance that seemed to her interminable where am i she murmured sydney are we quite lost but there was a carriage and why where am i she tried to sit up but they would not let her making her more comfortable now with pillows you are quite safe said mrs tracy in her kind voice here is sydney and you are all right did i faint asked elsie it was my hands the pain was awful i fainted once before from pain sydney why aren't we at school mr tracy brought us here as it was nearer when we found you were ill we must go home as soon as you are able elsie indeed you are not going back to the school to-night interposed mrs tracy i could not possibly allow it i will send a note to miss wickersham explaining it i think you must be sydney stuart whom i am expecting here to-morrow night are you not a friend of my young cousin anne talbot yes she is mother said alec coming forward he had kept in the background until elsie revived she is miss stuart and that is her friend miss brent i found them a good five miles from here don't let them go back to the school to-night i am sure it would not do for miss brent to go out in the cold again oh but i could said sydney i think i ought to go you must let me decide for you this time said mrs tracy apart from every other reason i should like to keep you overnight here i am with two young men on my hands already and two more boys coming and what i was going to do to amuse them all i do not know now we can have games and all sorts of fun and as for you i am sure you won't be sorry to have a little visit in a house that is not a school i went to boarding school myself i know it was impossible to resist her pleasant manner she was a young-looking woman with a charming face and humorous eyes good for you mother said alec shall i take the note no i think it would be more discreet to send thomas with it i will go write it shall i ask her to send me some of your things not dresses for you both look as nice as possible i will tell you what i will do i will write another note to anne and ask her to put up what you need for the night oh no not anne exclaimed sydney and then stopped well she is rather heedless i must confess laughed mrs tracy i will leave her out of it then she went into the library to her desk alec followed her to ask some questions and the girls were alone do you think we ought to stay elsie demanded sydney i feel like an impostor i am not anne's friend she didn't ask us because you were but because i was such an idiot as to faint replied elsie i don't see how we can do anything else but stay it would be rude to insist on going when she is so kind and they wouldn't let us walk so it would make a lot of trouble getting out a horse i think we had better stay it will be more polite and i shouldn't worry about all that sydney as long as we are here let's be as nice as we can mrs tracy soon returned and alec took the note to the man are you feeling better elsie she said i am not going to call you by any more formal title i am very fond of girls though i have nothing but sons they are pretty nice though if you feel stronger we might go upstairs to your room but wait i will have some tea made and you shall drink that 
before you stir she rang the bell and gave the order and very soon the maid brought in a big tray filled with old-fashioned silver and dainty old china and better still delicious bread and butter and fascinating cookies and tea alec came back and immediately went in search of his friend fred merriam he found him up in the boy's den at the top of the house aimlessly strumming on a banjo fred merriam was a long lank fellow with a solemn face in fact he rarely smiled himself but he possessed the happy faculty of making other people laugh his sense of humor was very keen and he had an unending stock of funny stories and quaint ideas which made him invaluable as a guest or a companion he and alec tracy had been chums at boarding school before they entered the same class at harvard i must say old mary what do you think exclaimed alec bursting into the room i never think my dear fellow said merriman gravely but i know that you have succeeded in spoiling the only tune i have been able to catch this afternoon why this agitation do you call that a tune but if you had just rescued two beautiful damsels from being lost in a snowstorm you would be agitated if you had driven them home and found that one had fainted on your carriage floor you would again be agitated if you had carried her into the house staggering under the unwanted burden oh come now trace it would take more than that to make you stagger unless she happens to be barnum's fat lady i suppose they were two of wicky's girls i should like to have seen wicky's face when her charges were brought home in that style what did she say say she has not yet said i didn't take them to the school not i they are here downstairs at this very minute drinking tea and i've come to fetch you to help them drink it come on alexander tracy two girls in the house all this time and you never told me if i don't pay you up and cut you out my name is norval on the grampian hills he cast aside the banjo and the two ran downstairs by the time they reached the top of the last flight they slackened their unseemly gait and two very proper and solemn young men walked decorously down to join the tea party they were not solemn long however and very soon sydney and elsie felt as completely at home as though they had been drinking tea together for years there was an atmosphere of cordiality and friendliness in this household that was very pleasant to the two schoolgirls how kind you all are exclaimed sydney impulsively when there was a sudden pause in the conversation what should we have done if you hadn't come along when you did mr tracy that was my good luck said alec i should say so said fred merriman mournfully tis ever thus alec tracy was born with a silver spoon in his mouth or perhaps it would be more correct this time to call the article a silver snow shovel metaphorically speaking he dug you out of a drift and it must have been a pleasant pastime i once dug a girl out of a drift you did said alec you never told me a word about it mary when where and who in cambridge my dear boy it is impossible to tell you all my adventures they come upon me so thick and fast but who was it that pretty girl who lives on brattle street i bet no i never heard the lady's name nor where she lived but she was a charming creature oh come now you must know something about her merriman paused a moment and his face grew sadder she proved to be an aged beggar he said 
and all she said was, Be off wid yer now. Yer be after helping yourself to me pocketbook, and yer adds insult to injury by trying to set me on me feet. And what did you do? asked Mrs. Tracy, when the laugh had subsided. I ran for all I was worth. She was so positive about the pocketbook that I began to feel as though I really had it. Just assume a positive manner, and you can make the other fellow believe anything you choose. The beggar lady must have been fully aware of that psychological fact. I am glad my young ladies didn't treat me so harshly, said Alec, with satisfaction. They have never mentioned their pocketbooks. Without wishing to appear to be prying into their affairs, said Merriman, I merely venture to suggest that it may have been for the same reason as that which caused a young philosopher named Johnny to neglect his supper. Why was that? asked Sidney. Because, alas, he hadn't any. Then they all laughed again. It takes very little to make a party of young people laugh, I am glad to say. And then, when all the food had been eaten, Mrs. Tracy and the girls went upstairs. Elsie now quite herself again, and Sydney feeling happier that she had for some days. End of chapter 9 Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C.